You want your knees as close to the patient as possible, and you want your shoulders over the patient so that your arms are nice and straight. And then you're not bending your arms so that you're, you're working out your arms. You're using the whole weight of your body to do the compressions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Stillwagon. I am a paramedic for AMR, American Medical Response, and also Gold Coast Ambulance in Ventura County. I've been a paramedic for 16 years, and I'm also the Community Health Services Manager for Ventura County. Uh, so what that means is we specialize in doing uh, public education, community service, community events just like this. And uh, Hadi is with me today. Uh, he's actually the one responsible for setting this all up and uh, getting us out here so that we can teach you about uh, CPR and uh, most specifically compression only CPR. So who would actually know what to do in the event of an emergency? Besides call 911. Who would, who would actually know what to do? Who would feel comfortable doing something if somebody collapsed right here on the floor, if one of, your, uh, one of your teachers or if one of your clients collapsed on the floor in front of you? Who would actually know what to do besides call 911? Okay, so that's why we're here today. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, about compression-only CPR. Uh, how many of you, when you hear the word CPR, think mouth-to-mouth? -mouth? Okay. How many of you would feel comfortable doing mouth-to-mouth on a stranger if they collapsed? One of you? Only one? That's a very brave person right there that would do that. Uh, most people wouldn't because it's a stranger. You don't know them. You don't know if they've got diseases. You don't know anything about them. So most people uh, wouldn't want to come up and kiss a stranger if somebody, if somebody collapsed and fell on the ground. We do compressions uh, on a chest anytime somebody goes into cardiac arrest. It's not a heart attack. A lot of people make that mistake. They confuse a heart attack for a cardiac arrest. A cardiac arrest is when the heart just stops for no reason, without warning. It can happen to anybody of any age, of any gender, um, with a medical history or without a medical history. It can be a 17-year-old athlete. It can be a 60-year-old man. It could be any one of us. Their heart, for whatever reason, just stops, and that person collapses and now there's no activity going on in the body. And if we don't do something for them in a couple of minutes, they're going to die. Um, the main thing that we're concerned about is if the heart's not beating, there's no blood moving through the body. And if there's no blood moving through the body, there's no oxygen in the blood moving through the body. And if there's no oxygen moving through the body, then we're not keeping the vital organs alive. And the organ we're most concerned about is your brain because if we don't do anything to keep the brain alive and keep oxygen going to the brain, you've got about four or five minutes before irreversible brain damage can set in. So even if the paramedics show up, the fire department shows up, they're able to take that person to the hospital. If we don't do something in the first few minutes, there's no oxygen going to the brain. Those people, even if we save them, are gonna be brain damaged and not gonna have the same type of life that they had before their arrest. So four to five minutes is not a long time before the brain starts to die. And if you call 911, does anybody have an idea what the national average is for a 911 response? If you call 911? 20 minutes is a little long. Five to six minutes. Six minutes is actually the national, the national average for 911. So if it takes six minutes for help to get here and brain damage can start in four to five minutes, um, those numbers don't really add up uh, as far as being successful at really saving somebody and giving them a chance to go home to their families unless we do something right away. And that thing that we're going to do is compressions on the chest, it's CPR, we're going to keep that blood pumping and, and we're going to keep that brain alive. So uh, that's a real quick, simple explanation of why it's important that you should know how to do it because if somebody collapses right in front of you, well, uh, you know, while you're in class or while you're, you're treating somebody, you've got about five minutes uh, to save that brain before help gets there. And so we want you to feel confident in what to do and we want you to know that it's really very simple. It doesn't require mouth to mouth. It doesn't require a lot of numbers or a lot of things to remember. It's four steps. And so I'm going to demonstrate to you what those four steps are and then we're going to have all of you demonstrate how to do those four steps and, and be trained to save somebody's life. It's really that simple. So there's really nothing you can do to screw this up. Another reason people don't want to do anything to help is because they don't want to hurt the person. They don't want to break somebody's ribs or they don't want to do damage. They don't want to get sued. But you can't get worse than dead. 
And so if somebody collapses and their heart's not beating, they're dead. Breaking a rib by doing CPR is not going to make them worse. So with that being said, I'll go through the demonstration. I'll try to demonstrate it on the table so that everybody can see. When we do the demonstration, we're actually going to put the mannequins on the floor so that you can do CPR on the floor. Because if somebody collapses, they're not going to fall across the table. You're not going to be doing CPR on the table. It's going to be on the floor. And uh, our, our studies, our research has shown that as soon as you move a person off of the floor, the higher up they get, the worse the CPR is because your positioning is worse and you're using the wrong muscles and you're not as effective. Step number one, if somebody passes out or somebody collapses in front of you, they're sitting they're sitting in a chair over there, you're doing your thing with them and all of a sudden they say, I'm not feeling well or they don't look right and all of a sudden they collapse, fall out of their chair, fall on the ground. The first thing that we need to do, the first step is to make sure that they actually need CPR. If somebody, we find somebody laying on the ground, we don't just go up and start pushing on the chest. Because if that person fainted, or they're sleeping, or there's something else going on, uh, they're not going to be very happy with you just pushing on their chest. So, step number one is to determine that they're responsive. So we do that by grabbing them by the shoulders, giving them a shake, and saying, hey, are you okay? Wake up. If you know their name, you can say their name. If you don't, just say, hey, wake up. Okay? We don't slap them. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't beat them up. We just, but we got to be firm. Grab them by the shoulders and shake them and say, hey, wake up. If there's anything else going on with them, they'll give you some kind of a response. They'll, they'll moan, they'll push their hand away, they'll wake up, they'll, they'll say something, they'll, they'll, they'll roll away. Um, they'll do something if, if they're able to. But if you shake them and they don't respond at all, then we're going to move right into the next step and we're going to assume the worst. So, step one, shake and shout. Step two is to call 911. So hopefully you're not alone when this type of thing happens. There'll be a lot of people like this standing around watching. So the second step is to make sure that somebody calls 911. It's really important that you make eye contact with somebody and you say, you go call 911, tell them somebody's collapsed in the cosmetology department at uh, the occupational health center. If you just shout it out, if I just shout out, hey, somebody call 911 to a group like this, some of you might be looking around wondering, is he talking to me? Should I do that? Maybe this person's going to call. Maybe they're going to call. I won't call because we don't want three people calling 911. And so nobody will call 911. So it's really important that you don't just shout it out and hope that somebody will take your advice. You really want to make eye contact and you want to say, give them a collapsed, tell them to send help. So that's step number two is to call 911. If you are by yourself, you can call 911 on your cell phone, put it on speaker, and set it right down next to you so that when they answer, they can talk you through the process. You don't have to leave, and you can continue to do uh, the next step, step three, which is actually doing the compressions. So, have someone call 911. Unless you're by yourself, then you can use your phone. Uh, step three is to actually do the compressions. And it's real simple. We put our hands right in the center of the chest, and you want to keep your arms nice and straight. So the best way to do this is to get your knees up real close to the patient. I'll show you what it should look like on the floor. But you want to get your knees up as close to the patient as possible and you want your shoulders to be over the patient like this. You don't want to be way back here flexing your arms doing it like this. You'll get a lot more tired, a lot faster, and you won't be as effective. You want to get up nice and close so you can keep your arms nice and straight and then you're going to start pushing on the chest hard and fast. You're not going to count, you're not going to worry about numbers or anything else you're going to start pushing on the chest, pushing hard and pushing fast. You have to do about a hundred compressions a minute is what they want. So that's faster than one a second, so it's pretty fast. And you want to be pushing down hard enough that you're squeezing that heart and that you're pushing the blood through the body, which is pushing the oxygen through the body, which is going to keep the brain alive. Now you can hear that the mannequin is clicking. Most people don't click, so that's not really going to be able, you're not going to be able to listen for that to tell if you're doing it right. But that gives you an idea. That's about two inches, and two inches is pretty deep, um, especially on somebody who is, is kind of thick and kind of sturdy. That takes a lot of weight. So the clicking is designed to give you an idea of just how far down you have to push in order to be effective. So if you get up here and you start doing this, and you're thinking, I'm awesome, I'm saving somebody's life, <laughs> but there's no clicking, chances are you're not pushing down hard enough. So you really want to 
You really want to make it click and you want to get a sense for what that feels like and then you want to push hard and push fast. You can't see it from where you're sitting, but the other thing this mannequin will tell you, it's got LED lights up here in the shoulder, which again, most people don't have, so you can't rely on those if this happens for real. But with the mannequin, you've got LED lights in the shoulder. One green light is for the rate to let you know you're going fast enough. The other green light is for the depth to let you know you're going deep enough. So when you get down here and you start doing this and you start feeling the click, if you've got two green lights in the shoulder, then you're perfect. If there's a yellow light or a red light, then we need to make an adjustment and, and maybe push a little harder, maybe push a little faster. So everybody will get a chance to feel what that's like when you come up and, and, and do this. So that's step three. Compressions on the chest. Push hard and push fast. And you're going to continue to do that. And step four is to stay with the patient until, until help shows up and they're ready to take over. So it's important that you do both of those. Stay with the patient and continue to do this until help shows up. So if, uh, if you can see through the window there and you're doing compressions and you see the fire engine show up or you see the ambulance show up, you don't say, oh great, those guys are here. Stop. Go out to meet them. Hey, they're back in here. Um, and, and abandon the patient because any time that we're not doing compressions is, is time that we're running the risk that we're going to give them brain damage. We don't, we don't want to interrupt the compressions until we absolutely have to. So stay with the patient, continue to do your compressions until someone actually comes in and says, okay, we'll take over. Uh, thank you very much, you can, you can step back. So don't stop, stay with your patient. The only, other, the only other way that you would stop doing compressions is if they open their eyes and they sit up and they say, ow, that hurts, stop pushing on my chest. Then you're gonna stop doing compressions and you've obviously done something positive for them. So if you get tired, which you will, after about two minutes of CPR, uh, which you probably won't be counting, but you'll start to tell when you're getting tired um, and you're feeling worn out, your CPR is not going to be as good. That's when you grab somebody else who's standing by, who's, who's watching, and you say, come on over and do what I'm doing. Take over for me and push, push on the chest. Because six minutes to respond, maybe eight minutes, maybe ten minutes to respond, you don't want to be the only one doing CPR for ten minutes. You're going to get wiped out. You're not going to be doing as good of a compression as you should. So use the people that are around you and every come in and, and take over and do CPR. So, uh, so find that person, switch out with them every two minutes or get two or three people to rotate in and do CPR until help shows up. So that is it. It's, it's four steps um, is really all you need to know. Uh, you can take a class. You can go spend three or four hours um, learning a lot more about how and, and why this works and why we do what we do. And they teach you different ratios and numbers and there's... Uh, some things you can learn about infants and kids, but the reality is to be effective, to actually save somebody's life, it's four steps. Uh, shaking and shouting, calling 911, doing compressions, pushing hard, pushing fast, and staying with the patient and continuing to do that until, until you have a positive outcome or until help shows up. Uh, that's, that's really as, as simple as it gets. No breathing, no mouth to mouth, um, no numbers or confusing things to think about, pushing on the chest, and don't stop. And, and that, that alone, all the things that the paramedics do, all the things the fire department does, those things help, but the number one thing that, that is going to save somebody's life is early compressions, usually by a bystander. And this only gets done about 30% of the time nationwide. Um, so 70% of the time, nobody's getting help. And those people aren't going home to their families after a cardiac arrest, at least not in the condition that they were before. So the more people we can train to do this, the more confident you are, the more people we can save and actually send home to their families um, neurologically intact, acting just like they were before uh, their event. Um, component of, of the, the full training that the American Heart Association offers in order to get a card, uh, there are things that we have to go through uh, with the AED, the defibrillator, with uh, kids and infants and choking, and there's a lot of other components that make up the class. So unfortunately this does not earn you a, a card, but um, the, the people that are interested in obtaining a card or getting that full training are definitely free to do so. What we're trying to do is reach the largest number of people who don't necessarily need a card, want a card, but they want to feel like they're able to do something in the event of an emergency. And so that's why we do this training because it's quick, it's simple, and it's effective, um, but unfortunately does not meet the, the requirements for we don't do a pulse. We don't check. No, no. Uh, the goal is to eliminate all of all of the possible reasons that would keep somebody from doing CPR. Because 
in a worst case scenario, if somebody does have a pulse and we start doing CPR on them, it's not going to hurt them or make it worse. If they've got a pulse and we do some compressions, it won't it won't make it, it worse. But a lot of people don't know how to feel a pulse. Um, I can tell you, you know, you can feel your pulse in your neck and most people can do it, but finding it on another person uh, can be a little more challenging. And if people are really amped up because it's a stressful situation, they may not be feeling in the right place or they might be imagining uh, that they're feeling the person's pulse when actually they're just feeling their own pulse in their fingers. And so we want to minimize anything that's going to delay the compressions because the clock is ticking. We've got about four to five minutes to be effective to circulate that, that blood. And so we want to encourage people to just jump right on the compressions. How many times have you pulled up to a scene and see somebody doing it? Uh, I was going to ask, have you ever actually seen it work? Too? Yes. Um, Duh. Both, good questions. Let me answer the first. Yes, there are people that do CPR about a, about a third of the time. Really? Um, yeah. That's good. Uh, and just to give you an idea, in Ventura County, last year we had... Um, we had a hundred, a, few, a little over a hundred cardiac arrests in Ventura County that we actually treated and transported and, and worked up. Uh, 32 of those went home to their families, walking, talking, just like they were prior to, prior to the event. All 32 had bystander CPR. No way. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. so the people that didn't get bystander CPR either didn't survive or they never left the hospital because they were brain damaged and they were on machines for for the rest of their life. So you want your knees as close to the patient as possible and you want your shoulders over the patient so that your arms are nice and straight. And then you're not bending your arms so that you're, you're working out your arms. You're using the whole weight of your body to do the compressions. So you keep your arms nice and straight and Just like that. So, so if you're bending your arms, if you're sitting way back here and you're leaning over and you're bending your arms to do it, uh, you're going to hurt yourself, you're going to tire yourself out, uh, and you're not going to be as effective doing the compressions. That's why it's really important to almost touch the patient and get up nice and close when you do that. So, because uh, we want you to keep your arms nice and straight because you'll be more effective. So, uh, <laughs> 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 shake yourself. 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 Sh